Hello strategy gaming enthusiasts, my name is Alzebo HD. In today's challenge video, we are playing Millennia and will seek to conquer the world without settling a single city. You can achieve victory in many ways in this upcoming 4x strategy, but perhaps the most OP is breaking the game in its entirety. Previously, we've beaten Civ 5 without a single city, and in Millennia, we'll go a step further by limiting ourselves to absolutely no settlers, no vassal integration, and by selecting the master difficulty to make things spicy. The Aztec Empire is a perfect choice to fit the theme of our vassal swarm strategy, and we'll select the bonus of a free scout, but before we get started, I'd like to give a special thanks to Paradox Interactive, who are the publisher of Millennia and the sponsor of today's video. The Aztecs start their campaign in 10,000 BCE with a single settlement of unpronounceable consonants, so our first order as ruler will be to rename our city to T-Town. We'll construct a dolmen to start expanding our borders and research scouting to explore for neighbors. We've opted to start our campaign with the bonus of a free scout, which we'll use with our warriors to discover the ancient world. It's only been a single turn, and we've already located a landmark and the city of Hagen, known in millennia as a minor nation. By using the Discover ability on our scout, we've uncovered the landmark as a tropical rainforest and gain exploration experience in addition to finding an encampment, which grants us government XP. Using some of this experience, we can unlock tribal farming to boost the population growth of our capital and only city. To our north, another encampment yields us exploration experience, which will allow us to spawn a second scout for free, and for the first time in history, our tribe was ready to embrace a cultural power, and will choose Eureka to tech up immediately. With the scouting technology unlocked, we've spawned yet another explorer for free, giving us three in total. Our ancient astronaut explorers uncovered the Borneo rainforest, received a barbarian archer for free via RNG, and uncovered two new landmarks, which is incredibly lucky in the early game. Unfortunately, we also discovered the Russians, and even worse, they were sending out a settler to spawn a second city only nine turns into our campaign. To our south, the second minor nation of Cum was discovered, and we're on a scouting spree as Dora explored yet another landmark. Oral history would lend us knowledge, but we knew instinctively the ancient Adidas tribe were up to no good before they spoke out and erased all doubt. Russia demanded respect, and we responded by researching defensive technologies and listening to our tribal leaders. If we research three technologies before any other country, we can potentially advance to the Age of Bronze before any other nation decides history. Our cavemen clubbers were thus sent to the north, and our scouts confirmed yet another rainforest, followed by Mount Everest. The more we explore, the more exploration experience we'll receive, which we'll employ to spawn our fourth free scout cavalry, and our fifth landmark was revealed to be a fulfillment facility. Further to our west, we've uncovered the borders of Isis and found yet another tribal encampment, giving us a fifth free scouting unit. The territory of T-Town was expanding slowly but surely, and unlocking the Elder technology meant we could rush into the Age of Bronze. Unfortunately, the Russians settled the least convenient tile possible, and now blocked our scouts from returning home, and at home, the construction of hunting camps provided T-Town with the tendies needed to grow our population. Leave it to a Russian to colonize your continent and tell you to leave, but before we could deal with these Slav squatting squatters, the minor nation of Hagen was in our way. Our sixth discovered landmark was big in Japan, and with our third tribal reform, it was time to raise an army for free with military XP. The Aztec Empire had by now surrounded Hagen, and it was time to prepare for trouble, but make it double. The Turks watched on cautiously and wished us strength and honor, but our horde of cavemen were getting clobbered in combat. It took three attempts to knock away their defensive fortifications, and by turn 15, it was over, and Hagen became our first vassal taken in war, and in time would pay tribute. 
But time, like money, was finite, and the Japanese beat us by being the first nation to advance to the Age of Bronze. The irony of reaching the age of metallurgy is that we have a serious lack of money, and our bankruptcy disbanded our warriors, followed by our scouts. At least we are among our bronze brethren, but we need shock therapy to even afford our military. We'll need a plantation to fund our nation into a banana republic, but with the advent of metal, our military was about to change the course of human history. Researching the Age of Bronze grants us our first national spirit and will opt for raiders even though it's already been taken. I seriously can't emphasize how broken raiders are for a military victory, and the world will soon see the power of Norse technology. Diplomatically, we've met Britain over a cup of tea in Tea Town, and will use our government powers to summon a second tribal army. Rossiya is decidedly less friendly and declared hostilities, and despite us surrounding their settlement of Suzdal, we could not afford our Flintstone army and continued to lose units to bankruptcy turn after turn. It was their choice to be hostile, but it was our choice to escalate, and in 4700 BC, the Aztecs declared war on the major nation of Russia. With the power of one leader and two archer units, their city and garrison was overrun, and we had taken our first city from another civilization, giving us two total vassals and three cities spanning the Gulf of Mexico. By turn 26, we could finally embrace the marauder ethos, and removing Russians in and around our new city meant that the Age of Blood might define our future era. With the exploration power of Eureka, our empire instantly researched official technology, which spawned an emissary who we guarded with yet more spontaneously spawned raiders. Diplomats can vassalize city-states in a single click and will conquer come with words, but the pen is not mightier in Aztec antiquity. Our policy of no Russian threatened the Age of Blood if we killed another soldier, and that's exactly what we're going to do after spawning more raiders with 20 warfare mana. The final straw broke when our bronze barbarians scalped their sixth soldier, all but guaranteeing us the Age of Blood if we control the future. The Russians had captured the city-state of Seiza, and our tribe had attained tribal reformation, leaving our nation little else to do than raid Russia with Viking raiders the way that history intended. Raiders are already incredibly powerful in the Age of Bronze, but they're about to be free with no upkeep. These freely spawning, self-replicating raiders are so powerful that they can solo settlements and outright captured Seiza in a single turn, vassalizing the fourth city into our triple alliance. Infestations of rebel swine were cleaned out by spawning more raiders, who in addition to cities could also solo barbarian armies. Conquering and vassalizing cities provided a growing economy based on tribute payments, which meant that we could afford our military and also afford to rush culture via currency. We'll use the domain cultural power to make our first town within our only controlled region, and Zalapa extended our reach into sheep and cotton. We're spawning raiders for free almost every single turn, and Russian conscripts were feeding our raiders with military experience. There would be war, but no peace as we researched discipline, but Russia had reached three bronze technologies ahead of us and could thus progress to the Age of Iron before we could reach the Age of Blood. They would have to pay with their blood for preventing us from enacting my favorite era of Aztec history, and their units were thus stack-wiped entirely. Their only town outside their capital was destroyed, revealing hidden Japanese in the bushes, and this collapsing country brought history into the future by unfortunately enacting the Age of Iron. The southern city-state of Isis was voluntold into our vassal swarm, and with Moscow surrounded, the walls were beaten down, followed by the tower defenses, capturing the Russian capital and making Moscow our largest and most profitable vassal. It's time to finish what we've started and sack Novgorod, but just as the Slavs before us, we have now reached an age of iron and industry. It's time to pay the iron price for the remaining Russian rump realm, and we'll embrace the Slavic tradition of sacking Novgorod. 
But barbarians with big irons were invading our lands, and an inconvenient truce saved Russia from the dustbin of history. These rebels were knocking on heaven's door, but we don't accept separatist solicitation. Aztec culture was preparing for a peaceful revolution and ultimately adopted monarchy as an institution, logical as their tenants would later boost our vassal's prosperity. Isis fell to the resistance but was later rendered onto Quetzalcoatl, and with our Russian truce over, the Aztec Empire declared a special mobilization operation in 1940 BC. This city was nice, so we'll sack it twice and delete the Russian realm in a single turn. Our Aztec Slavo superstate had absorbed its first foreign fiefdom, but this land was only the first step in the long ladder of ending all human life. The land of Nippon called to our kingdom, and we responded with the greeting of our people. In terms of imperial ideals, we could finally complete our victor's legacy, and chaos could thus be averted with fiat currency. The Japanese aggressively exterminated our friendly scouting squads, so it was time for war. Their town of Sendai died immediately, and with our power to summon unlimited raiders and raise free armies, it was time to Aztec Edo in mass. Many of our raiders would die, but it was a price we were willing to pay to win our first Japanese clay, but the forest and trees were speaking Japanese, and they heavily outnumbered our Aztec army. Thousands of men were locked in Iron Age trench warfare, and a countless number were converted into fertilizer, but the tide was shifting into our favor, and the Japanese wanted to give peace a chance. India also wanted a piece of the polity and declared a tag team so we'd have to move at sonic speed to surround the crown capital of Kyoto. If you've played a Nintendo video game, you'd know that every boss fight ends in three blows, and so it was that Kyoto fell in 800 BCE after three strikes and a series of sieges. Sayonara gozaimasu, this marked the second time we've eliminated a nation from history, and Yokohama disbanded into a ronin rum state. Despite India's warnings and open intentions of hostility, our raiders rallied the ruins into a vassal, and back at the capital, T-Town expanded her borders by absorbing an outpost into a second settlement. Drinking water in Mexico City is always an RNG uncertainty, and Moctezuma's revenge brought a plague upon our polity, but like all bad things in life, England was the guilty party. Britain, for some cursed reason, chose to summon an age of plague and immediately wiped away a third of humanity. T-Town lost over four pops, and our economy was in ruins, as hundreds of thousands of people perished due to British biological warfare, but thankfully every foreign state suffered the same fate. As if plague and English conspiracies weren't bad enough already, India used the opportunity to declare war against us in 140 BCE. J. Balaki, their army is huge, and our own was weakened from war and far from the front line. With Kyoto under fire, we'll use our government power to summon immortal defenders and forcibly march our men into protecting the northern frontier. Our first innovation would force other nations to bend their knee to multiplicative military modifiers. We're hooked on bubonics as the Aztec nation entered into the new age, and Khan now select a new national spirit, which of course will be modeled after militant Mongolians. By selecting this ethos, we've spawned three free horse archers and one Khan general, and this death stack of 200 military power was immediately sent to relieve the siege of Edo. The Indian invaders reached as far as Russia, but instead of sacking Novgorod, they were sacked of life in one shot by the Emperor's entourage. Our choice of national spirit had single-handedly swung the war into an Aztec advantage, and our southern divisions dealt with Delhi as our horses galloped into northern India. It's too late to apologize, and our Khan ripped apart cities with ease, and with the adoption of Kashigs, could now spawn for free the most OP military unit in all of millennia. Of course, raising free armies and multiplying horse husbandry costs monthly maintenance, so we'll have our kingdom embrace Soutage so we can steal cash directly from our vassals in exchange for a hit in prosperity. Fukuoka's fall now meant we had 12 vassals from which to cash in, and with central India increasingly surrounded, Bhopal bent the knee in 700 AD. 
The road now lay open to the Indian capital of Amaravati. Sieging the city would not be easy, but we've gone too far to lose it all. Instead, we'll install satraps to increase all of our vassals' prosperity, and with the city under siege, the walls eventually fell as our army became full-time employees. The largest and most populated city in the world had at last surrendered, but with our army far from home, the treacherous Turks tried to make trouble in T-Town. The Ottomans were turking our jobs and our land, and right as we were about to finish off India, a truce kicked us out of the war, ending the over 1,000 year conflict or millennia mega campaign between our two civilizations. Waiting for truces is no fun, so we'll announce our hostilities to Greece, but the Turks were attempting to take out our vassals and capital region. During this liminal period, we farmed Greek beasts for military experience, and once the truce with India expired, war was declared, no one was spared, and their final city fell to Apocalypto. Defending T-Town from Turkish predation required only a token amount of defensive forces, so it was time to turn east into the land of the rising sun. We are the Aztecs, and invading the old world in a sunset invasion runs in our DLC DNA, so the Hellenic world found itself in war against the Vassal Swarm in 1060 AD. Our horse archers blew away Pulawo, and the southern flank secured Antakya in only one turn, and our army raised its way to the south, pillaging and plundering to pay for military upkeep. This loot paid off a revolution in its entirety, but the Turks managed to take out the town of Zalapa, forcing us to rebuild it at a great loss to its own territory. Using the power of forced marches, Archon and his archers occupied the cities of Syracuse and Athens in only one turn, and a white peace with the Turks meant that we could focus entirely on wiping Greece from the east. This was Sparta before the horses had their way, and Delphi was deleted from the map followed by Signidium, Corinth, and Nicomedia. The Greeks were so weak that they could not resist our Meso-American, and when their final city of Oh My God Gonna Love You fell, a whisper could be heard as democracy died in 1280 AD. Only three nations remained outside of our swarm of subjugated states, and Britain deleted Rome on their own, leaving only England and Turkey for us to fell as the Black Death faded into an era of enlightenment. Albion was, for some reason, upset with our intentions, and warned our king before declaring war, forcing us to defend our way into and depopulating London. Unfortunately, curiosity killed our Khan, but North Ireland was hardly a trouble for our Jaguar warriors, and Scotland soon found itself under new management. Nobamba was next to fall, and bordered an island of armed barbarians, also known as our ally, Australia. As a militant nation, our first renaissance innovation was gunpowder, but the Turks joined the British coalition in 1415, forcing us to accelerate the decolonization of Britain. The English begged for peace, but their capital at Canterbury collapsed five years later, and with city after city being liberated from culinary crimes, we invented the right to bear arms. Old York's occupation signaled the fall of England's sovereign nation, and although the Turks wanted to coexist peacefully, we're the Aztecs, so we'll raise an army, colonize China for fun, and prepare our army for an Anatolian vacation. Turkey's the only independent nation left in our circular world, and if this continent was a donut of death, they would be the central filling. We've saved the best for last, and war was waged on turn 163, with our forces marching on Tripoli to the west and the city of Azaram to the east. Unlike the Turks, we have gunpowder and siege weaponry, and this eastern city was the first to fall, though it was far from the last. Their capital city of Istanbul, not Constantinople, was by this time the most populated polity on Pangaea, and by implementing hit-and-run tactics, our Aztecs were able to strike the city and use the power of forced marches to retreat from retaliation. Peace was never an option, and after non-stop horsing around town, the Theodosian walls tumbled down, and the defenders were gunned down, halving the population of the city of world's desire and vassalizing it into our nation. 
Turkiya was thus stripped of her coastal counties and became landlocked like a typical Turkic stan. Our western front invaded Izmir, which spawned the creation of an Aztec great artist, who in turn painted the Moctezuma Lisa and spawned a cultural movement that then spawned more armies. Imperial cannons rained fire upon the walls of the enemy, and without fortifications, their cities rapidly became stable vassals for a horde of horse archers. T-Town had quickly become the most prosperous city as the only region immune from Aztec invasion, and by reaping suitage from over 40 vassals, our kingdom was so rich that it could pay off any and all consequences of chaos generation. With the power of diplomacy, our empire could finally form a religion worthy of Mel Gibson, and the second global faith known as Human Sacrifice was founded in 1555 AD. Bombs over Baghdad exposed Turkey's final city and sole point of resistance, but resistance was futile as now every city was finally assimilated. This would be the final turn of our campaign, as we've effectively united the world under military occupation, and with only one city on master difficulty, we've beaten millennia by the Enlightenment era through the combined power of friendship, gunpowder, and horsepower. The year is 1555 AD, and the world is a dystopian hellscape ravaged by war and plague. Of the 46 cities in the world, 45 are vassalized and routinely milked for money by the Aztec world government, and barbarians are literally everywhere as they are permanently at peace with us following our Khan's legacy. If you somehow survived Aztec raiders or barbarians in your backyard, plague and guns would have likely gotten you instead. The capital of Tenochtitlan, also known as T-Town, is the most populated center of this Pangaea world, and has a development level of what you'd expect from illiterate barbarians that neglected any infrastructure that didn't involve direct decapitation. Our nation is a kingdom founded on human sacrifice, though the majority of the world believes in Hinduism, which was founded in formerly Turkish Azaram. Throughout our game, we've only controlled a single city directly, and never settled any land outside of armed annexation, and with no other nation to conquer, the Aztec Empire will likely farm their own people for piety as we approach the 17th century. If you've liked what you see, and want to support Azabo HD for free, be sure to drop a comment, like the video, and subscribe for more strategy gaming content. This video was made in partnership with Paradox Interactive, so check out Millennia when it releases on March 26th, and check out the link in the description box below. For the sake of vassal prosperity, please consider supporting me on Patreon or by becoming a YouTube channel member, and next time I'll see your name in the credits.